Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful for the move of the Holy Spirit amongst us already, God. What a joy and a privilege and an honor to be in your house, God, and to be in your presence, God. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done in hearts and lives. God, we don't want to stop there, though. We want to go farther. We want to go deeper with you. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. For truly, we did not come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. We came to hear from Almighty God. So Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Give us eyes to see, ears that hear, and hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we don't ask this blessing only upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, denominational, non-denominational, affiliated, unaffiliated, small or large. God, if they're preaching your gospel and your truth, we bless them this day in Jesus' name. And God, also, we don't want to forget our brothers and sisters that are persecuted, those that are in prisons or bondages, God. We ask that you deliver them, God, that you strengthen them and encourage them, God. Provide for them and protect them, God. And bless them, Lord, as you would bless us this day. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. And we say, Amen. Amen. Well, today, as you're being seated, get your Bibles and go with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, once again. Today we're going to be launching into verse number five, but before we do that, you know, sometimes people, when, when talking about sermons and that sort of thing, they, they kind of scoff at, at sermons, and they kind of, uh, you know, kick back at certain uh, different things, you know, three points in a poem, and they, and they make, you know, I don't want the three points in a poem. Well, listen, some people like poetry. Anybody like poetry in this place? Okay, now you guys heard the poem, uh, Footprints in the Sand. You guys remember that one? If you don't know that one, let me read it to you. It's, 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 it's applicable to where we're going today. And, and I really like this poem. It's always beautiful, and they've always got the beautiful pictures and the images, you know, the beach scenes and things like that that go with it. But here, here's the poem. It's by Mary Stevenson. And it says this. One night I dreamed a dream as I walked along the beach with my Lord. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, my precious child, I love you. And I would never leave you. Never, ever during your trials and your testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Now that's a beautiful example and I believe that's applicable to what we're going to be talking about today. We'll talk more about that, about walking with the Lord as we go throughout the message today. But I found another poem that I thought I might share, very similar to the one that we just read, uh, but, a, but a little bit different in, in its quality and, and, and in the type of verbiage that they use. This, this poem is, is an anonymously written one, but it's called Butt Prints in the Sand. I'm sorry, is it okay to say button church? Uh, it's good? All right. I, I won't use the three-letter one. You know, we'll, we'll skip that one. We'll go, we'll go with butt prints, okay? One night I had a wondrous dream. One set of footprints there was seen. The footprints of my precious Lord, but mine were not along the shore. But then some stranger prints appeared, and I asked the Lord, what have we here? Those prints are large and round and neat, but Lord, they are too big for feet. My child, he said in somber tones, for miles I carried you alone. I challenged you to walk in faith, but you refused and made me wait. You disobeyed, you would not grow, the walk of faith you would not know. So I got tired, I got fed up, and there I dropped you on your butt. (laughs) Because in life there comes a time when one must fight and one must climb, when one must rise and take a stand or leave their butt prints in the sand. Very good, huh?
Today, lest we leave those neat round prints in the sand, I want to talk to you about a subject called walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 5. We're going to find out what this means as we go throughout. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 5 says this. It says, by faith. Everybody say, by faith. faith. See, as we encounter Hebrews 11, chapter, and as we go throughout, we're going to encounter these two words again and again and again. No other life you're going to live except a life by faith. In fact, we walk by faith and not by sight. So if we're going to be walking with God, it's got to be a walk of faith. It says this, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, this Enoch is a man in the book of Genesis, the fifth chapter, that we find in the lineage of Adam and Eve through their son, Seth. You remember last time we were together, we talked about Cain and Abel, right? Now, Cain murdered his brother Abel, so Abel was taken away from the earth. He died, and yet he was the one that pleased God. He was the one that was commended for his sacrifice. He was the one that, by faith, still speaks to us today, and, and his blood cried out to the Lord. And therefore, Abel no longer was able to have a godly line on the earth, so God provided another line through Seth. Now, the seventh from Adam through the line of Seth is this man by the name of Enoch. And we don't know very much about him. In fact, you know, the, the, the amount we knew about Abel, we may know even less about Enoch. We do know that Enoch was a prophet. We know that because of the book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. It talks about Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, the Lord is coming with his ten thousands of angels. He was a preacher of righteousness to his generation. And yet we find something out that after 65 years on the earth, Enoch had a son named Methuselah. You know Methuselah. He's the one that lived to be like 900 and some odd years old, right? Uh, the oldest living man that ever lived on the planet because at that time people actually lived longer than they do now before the Lord shortened man's days. And therefore, uh, after 65 years, it says that Enoch had Methuselah. And then Genesis, the fifth chapter, and verse number 24 says this, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In other words, Enoch was a man of faith, lived to be 365 years old, a year of years, right? And after he lived his life, Enoch walked with God and was not. In other words, he never died, for God took him. It was almost as if Enoch was taking a walk with God one day, and as they were walking, God said, Enoch, I've really enjoyed this time that we've had together. You know what? Why don't you not go home tonight? Just come with me. And he just took him up to heaven right then and there. Isn't that a neat thought? Enoch had a testimony with God that his life was pleasing to the Lord, so much so that God decided, hey, you know what? This guy, he's not going to see death. And Enoch, with his life, speaks to us today. Now, in the Bible, anytime you see the word walk, I want you to think of it in a certain way. Now, sometimes in the Bible, it is used like Jesus walked from Jericho to Jerusalem, right? And talking about point A to point B. You will see that in the Bible that there are times where they walked from one place to another, and it's talking about like Pastor Dan walked across the stage right now, okay? That's what you'll see in the Bible, and we understand that. But most of the time, in fact, the majority of the time, if you look this up in the Bible, you will find that the word walk does not mean going from point A to point B with your feet, what it really means is that you are to live out your life. That's the definition that you'll find in the Bible of the word walk. If we're going to walk in love, that means that we have to live out our life in love. Not just point A to point B with our legs and feet. No, we've got to live out our life in love because the Bible tells us to walk in love. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, that means that we are going to live out our life in the spirit. So walking with God today is more than just point A to point B with God. Walking with God means that we are to live out our life with God. That's really what's being said here. See, first is the worship like we talked about last week, that sacrifice that comes, and then comes the walk. What comes out of our worship is our walk. When you lay your life down on the altar, now you live out your life through that worship and through that sacrifice. See, if it's a worship in church, then it's a walk at home. If it's a worship in the morning at home, then it's a walk on the job in the afternoon. If it's a worship in our private devotion, then in our public relational life, it is a walk that we live out our life in this world with God. Now, our walk with God starts at the cross. Jesus' sacrifice is where everything flows from our life. 
That point of sacrifice is where it starts. And after the sacrifice comes the pleasure of God. Remember, Enoch walked with God and he was taken because he had this testimony that he pleased God. Don't you know that God was pleased with Jesus? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. See, when there is a life that's lived for God, a, a, a life that's laid down in sacrifice and then is lived out with God, that is a life by faith that is pleasing to God. And we'll discuss that in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 6, right after Easter when we come back to these verses, talking about the pursuit of God. And so in our lives, we need to understand that Abel shows us the life of sacrifice and worship and how death was the entrance to life. But it's no mistake that Enoch comes next in this hall of faith. God wasn't just taking a look at guys and said, well, I guess I'll take Abel and I'll take Enoch and I'll take Noah and I'll throw Abraham and Sarah in there. They were cool, you know. That's not how this was. God does everything on purpose. And there's a reason why God chose to start with Abel and then to move to Enoch because Abel shows us how in sacrifice there is worship and how death was the entrance to life. But Enoch shows us how a life lived out that pleases God triumphs over death. Are you listening? And if we're going to live a life that triumphs over death, then we have to walk with God. Because God is our life. He is our all in all. He is our everything. He's wonderful and he's amazing. Now, I want to start off today talking to you about some benefits of walking with God. In other words, if you know the benefits of something, that means you're going to do it, right? If you never knew the health benefits of eating right, you would just eat candy and chips and soda and all that kind of stuff. But when you realize that there are health benefits, that you can avoid uh, certain health problems in the future, diabetes and cancer and different things like that, all of a sudden you, you start buying food that's healthy. You start eating more fruits and vegetables. You start exercising. You start dieting. Why? Because you know the benefits that come with eating right. In the same way, if you never knew the benefits of stewardship, you would just spend your money however you want to. You would just live life however you want. You would never deny yourself anything that you wanted. You'd just be out there buying whatever. But then you started to learn the benefits of stewardship. That you know what? If I bring my tithe, God will bless me. If I start to save, then I can build up little by little and I can make large purchases. I don't have to be on credit. I don't have to be strapped. Uh, you start to learn the benefits of storing up for retirement and putting money aside for those later days when you're not working any longer. Now, see, because of the benefits, you start to live your life that way. It's the same thing with God. God says there are benefits to walking with God, and therefore, if you know the benefits, then you'll start walking with Him. Now, the first benefit that I want to point out is this, communion and fellowship with God. See, when you walk with God... Now there's a beautiful communion and there's a fellowship that takes place. You and God are relating. You're connecting on a deep level, on an intimate level. See, Enoch walked with God 365 years on the earth, a year of year. Every day of his life was lived out for God. Now he must have heard the word of the Lord because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if it was by faith that he did that, he heard the word of the Lord. He had a relationship with God and he lived out that life that was pleasing to God and he had communion and fellowship with God. Did you know God loves you? But beyond that, did you know that God even likes you? My goodness, God wants to be with you. That's why he sent Jesus, was because there was a separation, there was a chasm fixed between us, but now that Jesus has come, he has pulled down the wall of separation, and now he has brought us near by the blood of Jesus. Now we are accepted in the beloved. Now we have entrance. We can go into the very throne room of God, and we can get grace to help in a time of need. God has invited, the king has invited you into his private chambers. God wants a relationship with you. He loves you so much, he's numbered every hair on your head, no matter how many or how few. Loves you so much that he thinks about you every moment of every day more than the number of sand there is on the seashore. And I'm not talking about Newport or Huntington. I'm talking about worldwide. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's a lot of thoughts towards you and me. Wow. I know that kind of blew somebody's mind right now. They're going, whoa, that was deep. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's take a look at it in the Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, talking to them about holy living. Don't, don't do the stuff the world does. Don't be friends with the world. What are you doing yoking up with them? Why would you want to be bound to the world when God loves you so much? Why would you want to have intimate knowledge and relationship of worldly things when God is inviting you to have intimate 
knowledge and relationship with him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 16, you find chapter 7, just back up a couple of verses. Verse number 16, it says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? In other words, God is not an idol. God is not something made with man's hands. This is not an invention created by man. This is God Almighty, the preexistent one, the one who has the preeminence, the living God, the one who wants to have a relationship with you. What agreement? None. No agreement. And he says this, for you are the temple of the living God. That means that when you gave your heart and life to Jesus, he came to live, stay, and dwell on the inside of you. Holy Spirit just moved into the neighborhood. Hello. He was knocking on the door of your heart. You opened up and you said, come on in. And now he's sitting down and he's dining with you. He's having an intimate relationship with you. Look at what it says. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk. Everybody say walk. Oh, come on. Everybody say walk. And walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now all of a sudden, God is not ashamed to be called your God. And you are are his people. That's possessive. That's, that's, that's my God. That's my Jesus. That's my Holy Spirit. We're linked up. We're yoked up. We're one now. He's in me and I'm in him. And we have communion and fellowship. That's the benefit. God is our son and our shield. He is our exceeding great reward. He himself is the greatest benefit of all. Benefits of walking with God. What else? Well, how about this one? Escape death. See, when you walk with God... You escape death, just like Enoch. Someone once said that Enoch was too full of the living God to die. Isn't that a neat thought? He was too full of the living God to die. Why? Because God is a God of the resurrection. You may look at your life right now and say, there's a lot of dead things in my life, Pastor. You know, I looked at my bank account this morning. My bank statement was dead, in the grave. In fact, it was six feet under. Hello? Hello? And yet God looks at that, and if you're walking with God, God will bring resurrection life to that bank account. Say, Pastor, you don't know my marriage. There is no hope for that man. The woman is left. The, the marriage is dead. Well, thank God, God specializes in dead things. God is a God who raises the dead. He is the one that raised up Jesus from the grave. That marriage doesn't have to stay dead. You can believe God and you can walk with God and God will direct you into a life-filled marriage. Pastor, you don't know my kids. They've gone south. I've done everything I know to do. I've prayed. I told them the word. I raised them up in the ways. I disciplined them. I helped them. I, I did everything I could, Pastor. And yet they still made choices. Yeah, they're going to make choices. But listen, even the kids, though, they may have gone south. They may look like they've got one foot in the grave already. Listen, God can raise them up from the dead. God knows how to get them on the right path. God will raise them up. You walk with God. You believe God. God will work it out. Whatever the situation is, the boss may have your name on the list of people to ax. Doesn't matter. You're walking with God. If that's not the job for you, God's got a better job waiting for you on the other side of that. See, but if you walk with God, you don't have to worry about it. You know that escaping death also means escaping fear. The Bible says that Jesus came and he released those who were in bondage all their life to fear. He destroyed the works of the devil. You don't have to be... People all the time are afraid of the devil. He's out there, he's going to get me. He's gonna... No, listen, he's, he's a defeated foe. Jesus whipped him at the cross. Then when he was raised again to life and he was ascended to heaven, he went and he took the keys from the kingdom. And the Bible says he disarmed principalities and powers and, and those evil forces. Of darkness. You know what that means? Disarmed? That means devil's got no nukes. He's got no guns. He doesn't even have a club. He's got nothing. If he was a lion, Jesus pulled his teeth. That's why it says, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? See, you don't have to be afraid any longer. You don't have to fear. Now, I'm getting a weak, anemic clap, so I guess i got to show this to you in the Word. T turn me to Psalm 23. Psalm chapter 23, I think I got time, I'm going to give you the whole thing. I had one verse I was going to do, but the, the whole thing. You guys know this psalm, it's the one that they read on the movies where they're at the graveside, it's raining, everybody's got the black umbrellas up and they still got black sunglasses on even though, 
Why they need the sunglasses? It's raining. <laughs> Umbrella. Whatever. But did you know this is not a death psalm? This is a life psalm. I'm going to show it to you. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, if the Lord is my shepherd, you know where shepherds are, right? You know where they are? Where are they? They're on the pasture, right? They're with the sheep. Good shepherd smells like the sheep. Why? Because that's who shepherds hang out with all day, sheep. So if you're walking with God, then the Lord is your shepherd and you are his sheep. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me, walking with God, beside the still waters. Verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me, there's walking with God, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk... Did you see it? We're walking with who? With God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't camp out. We don't stay there. Listen, if I'm walking with God and God decides to walk me through hell, I know that I'm not staying in hell. No, I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death. Look at this. I will fear no evil. Doesn't matter. Come hell or high water does not matter. I don't care what you throw at me. Devil, come if you want. You're not going to do anything. In fact, devil, you're under my feet. You are a defeated foe, and I'm a part of the body of Christ. Jesus already whipped you. Therefore, I'm an overcomer in Christ. I'm more than a conqueror. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. See, if God's with you, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be crying. Oh, you know, this, and this world nation just got nukes. Listen, I don't care if they've got nukes. I've got God. Come on now. Well, what am I going to do? The people at work hate me, and, the, and you know, my, my relatives turn their back on me, and I don't know what they're going to do to me. And you, Pastor Dan, you don't know what I have to go home to. Listen, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God is with you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. If... If the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, then everywhere you go, he goes. Your rod and your staff, they come from me. What what was that all about? Rod and staff. You know what that's about? The rod was there so that the shepherd, if a wolf should come and try and take out one of the sheep, he would lift up that rod and he would whack that sucker. Right? Bible says savage wolves will rise up from among you, not sparing the flock. But listen, God will raise up his rod. He's going to whack that wolf trying to come and take out the sheep. See, I don't have to be afraid of people. God will take people out of the way if he has to. God will do what he needs to do. But then there's the staff. You know, the, the staff, as you've seen the shepherd's crook, right? It's got that little hook on the end. You know what that hook is for? That's for dumb sheep like me. Come on. I won't say in you, but you can say it to yourself. You know, that's for me too, Pastor. You can say it under your breath. No one's judging, all right? Why? Because sheep, they're not very smart animals, right? They just be eating. Then they get over here and they eat a little bit more. Well, the grass looks good over there. and eat a little bit more. And all of a sudden, they're wandering from the shepherd. You know what the shepherd does? He takes that staff and he's, no, come on back over here. Let me lead you beside the still waters. Let me, don't go eating that grass over, eat this grass. This is green pastures over here. And, and he just gets us right back on track with him. He pulls us. God wants a relationship, remember? You walk with God, God will keep you. About ready to go off the edge? Nope, wrong way. God will pull you back. See, God knows how to get you on track when you're walking with him. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, you can only sit down and eat a meal in the presence of your enemies when there's no fear. Otherwise, you'd be watching your back. You'd be saying, can somebody else take a drink of this water before I take a drink? Because they might have slipped something in it. (laughs) Check in your sandwich, make sure there's nothing in there. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. forever." didn't say I'd die. Didn't say I'd lay down and quit. Didn't say death reigns. No, said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever, just like Enoch, who did not see death 
Are you listening today? What's the last one? Last one is this. Benefits of walking with God. Communion and fellowship with God. Escape death. And last one is this. Supernatural life. Amen. See, when you walk with a supernatural God, then supernatural things are going to happen all around you. I love what Matthew Henry said about Enoch. He said, Enoch did not live like the rest, so he did not die like the rest. See, if you live a life the way God wants you to live it, and you walk with God, your life will be a supernatural life. Even though everybody else may be going this way, I'm going God's way. And you may watch the world crumble all around you. The world systems may be falling all around you. People may be freaking out. But you don't have to worry. You will live supernaturally. God will sustain you. God will uphold you. God will strengthen you. Why? Because he's a supernatural God. He is not bound by time or resource or strength or anything on this earth. He is almighty God. But let me tell you something, church. If you want to live an extraordinary life, you cannot live like the rest of the world. You can't do natural things and expect supernatural results. You've got to walk God's paths to get to God's places. Because if you walk the world's paths, you will get to worldly places. You say, but Pastor Dan, I don't know any other way. This is the way my daddy did it. This is the way my granddaddy did it. Well, listen, look at your daddy and your granddaddy's life and see if you like the place that they ended up. Because if you don't like it, doing the things that they did, you're going to get to the place that they went. Hello? If your daddy was a drunk and abandoned his family and, 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 and wrecked everything in your life, then what are you doing going to the bar and going to the bottle? Because if you follow that path, you're going to end up in that place. Hello? Now, if your daddy was a godly man, then you see what your daddy did. Oh, he prayed, he followed God, and my goodness, his life was blessed. Then follow that path. Why? Because that's a path of righteousness. Follow the supernatural path of God. Find out for yourself, what God, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do in marriage? God, what do you want me to do? See, the world has a way of doing marriage. And yet the world's marriages are falling apart. You say, Pastor Dan, but isn't the divorce rate the same in the church as it is outside of the church? No, that is a bad statistic. There is no foundation for that stat. It's actually better in the church than it is in the world. Come on, let's, let's get the truth out there. Churches have better marriages. But the devil would like to lie to you and tell you, oh, it's the same. You might as well not get married. Might as well just shack up and do your thing and have kids and just don't. You don't need to commit. It's not, that's an old way. That's, that's, you know, antiquated. You don't need to, no. Do it God's way and you'll have God's blessing on your life. What about children? Disciplining children. World says, oh, redirect them. They don't need any discipline. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have an ADD person, not child, person, adult, who is always looking to be redirected, who won't be able to hold down a job, won't be able to keep a marriage, won't be able to raise children. Why? Because they were never disciplined. And when the rubber meets the road in life, you better be disciplined. You want to keep a job, you better show up on time. You better ha work hard, and you better please your boss if you want to keep a job. You can't do that if you keep redirecting. You want to be healthy in marriage? Then you better do it God's way. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church is subject to Christ in all things. And yet we want to do everything our way and have the blessing. You can't have it unless you walk God's path. That's simple. As you do, you will have a supernatural walk with God. So how do we do it? How do we do it? I've told you the benefits. I think you guys want to do it. I think you guys are ready to do it. Pastor, tell me how to do it. Glad you asked that because I'm going to tell you, right? Even if you don't want it, you're going to get it. Here's two things, two quick things, two little words, agreement and obedience. Two little words. That's, that's it. That's all you need to know. How do I walk with God? Agreement and obedience. Agreement, what is that? You have to make the choice. You have to agree, God, I'm going your way. Amos chapter 3, verse number 3 says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? See, if I went to Pastor Joel, I said, Pastor Joel, let's take a walk. He says, sure, we both get up and we walk. He goes over to the youth auditorium, ends up at La Roca. I go back to the offices, find out what Pastor Luke's doing, studying, right? We, did we get to the same place? No, why? Because we weren't agreed. But if I went to Pastor Joel, I said, Pastor Joel, let's take a walk. Where do you want to go? Well, I was going to go back to the office. Why are you going back there? I don't know. Where are you going? I'm going over to youth out of term. Okay, let's go. Now we 
are agreed and we can make it to the same place together. See, in our life, we need to go and say, God, where are you going? God, what are you doing? Every morning in prayer, God, where are you going? What are you doing, God? Where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people. You are my God. I'm linked up with you. God, I'm going to get in line with you. And that brings us to the second thing is obedience. I'm going to put a sentence up there on the overheads for you that describes this, okay? But it's all summed up in the one word, obedience. This is the sentence we have to get in step with God, take his pace, and follow his direction. We have to get in step with God, take his pace, and follow his direction. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to give you permission to laugh at me. It's okay, all right? There's one time, but after that... When I was in high school, I was in the marching band. Thank you, thank you. All the jocks and the baseball players, yeah. I hear you. Add insult to injury, I had a ponytail too. Long ponytail, went halfway down my back. Can you picture me like that? So prim and proper, this little Hessian kid, right? So, uh, so I, I, I was, the, I mean, full on marching band, the, the, the cap with the plume and, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff and the sash and the cape and all that goodness, right? And the shiny shoes and everything. But when we would march, when we'd be in a parade or something like that, we couldn't just walk however we wanted to walk. There was a discipline that came with that. In the last church service, one of our, uh, our security uh, professionals, he was here and he was telling me how when he went to the police academy, they had to learn how to march. And, and because he was in marching band, he was leading everybody how to march. And the drill sergeant that came out of the Marines came up and said, where did you learn how to march like that? This is good marching. This is like military march. Where did you learn how to march like that? He said, marching band, sir. He said, get out of here. Ah. But see, we didn't take our own pace. We didn't just walk however we wanted to walk. There was a captain that was out in front of us, a drill captain, that we had to get in step with them. We didn't put our foot down when we wanted to put it down. No, they would lift it for the right and drop it for the left. So it was right, left, right, left. We had to watch. We had to make sure that we took their pace, that we didn't get ahead of them or didn't get behind them. And we had to follow the direction. When they started to turn, we started to turn. When they moved, we moved. If they stopped, we stopped. But you never stopped marching. You took the direction. See, it's no different with God. We need to get our eyes on Jesus. We need to follow the captain of our salvation. We need to get in step with him. God, what is it that you're doing? Because God, that's where I'm going. We need to take his place. Don't get ahead of God. Wait on the Lord, the Bible says, and he shall renew your strength. Follow his direction. Wherever God goes, you go. If God makes a change, you make a change. If God turns this way, you go that way. Whatever it is, what is that called? That's called obedience. Let's take a look at it in the Word. Jesus is speaking. John, the 8th chapter. Turn there with me. John, chapter number 8. Great chapter in the Bible. John, chapter number 8. In the New Testament, Gospel of John, Big John, chapter number 8. Jesus is speaking about this very topic Verse number 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk. Everybody say walk. Walk. Oh, come on now. Play with me today. Everybody say walk. Walk. Shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You know, the Bible says that your word, oh God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, as you walk in obedience, you don't have to stumble about in darkness wondering what God is doing, wondering where God is going. No, God will illuminate your path. He will make clear and straight paths before you if you trust in him, if you follow him. You're there in Big John. Turn with me to uh, Little John. In fact, 2 John. Go, go towards the back of your Bible. If you hit Revelation, come back a couple books. If you hit the maps, you've gone way too far. Come on back. 2 John. Little, little teeny tiny chapter in the Bible. Teeny tiny chapter in the Bible. 2 John. Just one chapter, verse number six. Anybody love the Lord? Amen. You guys love Jesus? Amen. I set you up. Take a look at it. Second John, verse six, this is love. You say you love Jesus, this is love. That we walk, everybody say walk, walk. according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk, everybody say walk, in it. See, it's so simple. God does not make this hard on us. Notice the bottom part of that. If we love God, we will keep his commandments. Jesus said that. You love me, you'll keep my commandments. So at the bottom of that, notice the three highlighted words. This is the commandment. As you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Commandment, hear, walk. That's simple. Whatever God says, 
You hear it, you receive it, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So you believe it, you accept it as truth, and then you walk in it. You live it out in your life. Whatever it is. Finances, hey, I heard the commandment to bring the tithe. I believe it, and therefore I bring it. I walk in it. I live it out in my life. Marriage is the commandment. Husbands love your wife. It's Christ love the church. Wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. I heard it, I believe it. I have faith for it, and then you live it out. Whatever it is, this works for every verse, every promise, every blessing in the Bible is you see the commandment, you hear it, you believe it by faith, and then you walk in it. Now, God doesn't tell you just what to do without also giving you the power to do it. And that's why it says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, Galatians chapter number five, verse number 16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, if we just tried to do this on our own, just hear, believe, right? Okay, I got the commandment, then I'm gonna live it out. You do it in your own power, it's gonna turn into religion. It's gonna turn into rules and regulations. I guess I shouldn't go uh, have sex outside of marriage because God says not to, you know? And then you're, you're burning with lust and there's all this stuff that's going on, there's this turmoil going on on the inside and God's saying, no, that's not what this is about. This is about us walking in the spirit that as you walk with God, as you walk in God, as you have that sweet communion and fellowship with God, then all of a sudden when that temptation, that pretty little thing rises up, right, and starts shaking things in front of you, you say, "Mm mm-mm, I'm with Jesus. See, the Bible says the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. We need to have a healthy no in our lives. Sin, no, I'm with him. Temptation, no, I'm with him. Devil, no. I'm with him. See, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, walk with God. See, think about how different your life would be if God was tangible and visible right next to you every moment of the day. We would probably live a different life. We'd probably watch the words of our mouth a little bit more closely. We'd probably watch what we do in life a bit more closely. We, in fact, we wouldn't even be thinking stuff because my... God can read my mind, and so I better not think that. See, but it doesn't have to be out of rules and regulations. That's why God lives on the inside of us. God wants intimacy and fellowship, and God wants us to do this of our free will. Therefore, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, all of a sudden, the grace of God is rising up on the inside of you, and when that temptation comes, you may look at it and go, but then all of a sudden, the Spirit of grace says, no, not going to happen, and you can say no, and you can overcome in every area of your life because God now is giving you the power to overcome. That's how you do it. It's agreement and it's obedience, plain and simple, from the word of God. Let me close with this today. Andrew Murray, a great man of God, Scottish preacher, said this, let every day, the most ordinary one, the most difficult one, be a day with God as one of the days of heaven upon earth, a day which faith is the beginning and the end. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him because he had this testimony that he was pleasing to the Lord. That's our testimony as we walk, we live on our life with God. Did you guys get something from the word today? Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to some of you guys before we go any further. Came into this place today and you know that Jesus saves. You sang the song, I believe in Jesus. Jesus, I believe in you. And yet there's still something missing from your life. There's still a void on the inside. And you know today, come on, let's be honest, let's talk with one another. You didn't come to church for someone to play games, blow smoke and water all over you. This is not a religious experience. You came to have an encounter with Almighty God. And God, before we go any further, hold on, don't clap, hold on, hold on, hold on. God, before we go any further, is talking to you about your life. He's already dealt with you. You know that if you were to die today, God forbid that should happen to anybody in this room, but you know you wouldn't make it. You'd end up in hell and you wouldn't go to heaven. Can we talk today? Can I love you enough to tell you the truth? And before we go any further, I want to give you the opportunity to give God all of your heart and to give God all of your life. And if that's you, you know the Spirit of God has spoken to you and you feel that void on the inside. You know Jesus, you know who He is, but He's not living on the inside of you. You're empty and you know you're coming up short. It's time to make a change. And that change starts today because Jesus saves. 
Jesus loves you. He went to the cross and died for you. And now he's inviting you to come. Give him all of your heart, all of your life. And he already gave you all his heart and all of his life. Now will you receive that gift? Will you invite him in and let him make you born again, brand new from the inside out? If you know God's speaking to you, you know that's you that I'm talking to right now. No one clap. You just get out in the aisle and you meet me up front. Just line up right here in the front. Just come on, wherever you're at. Step out into the aisle and make your way up front. That's you. You know God's speaking to you right now. You come. Come on. If that's you, don't waste another minute. Don't be stubborn. Resisting the Holy Spirit. He loves you. And he's pleading with you right now. Come. Come. Just make your way to the front right now. If you're in the family rooms, you're out there in the foyer, and you need to come, just come. Come on, make your way to the front right now person next to you, they'll, they'll move so that you can get out. It's okay. Say, I need to go. You just come right now. Come on down. They're still coming from the top. Come on down. God's tugging at your heart. It's asking you to come. Will you listen? Come. Come on, you can come too. You're not so bad that God doesn't want you to come. You haven't gone too far and you haven't messed up too much. That's why Jesus went to the cross. The wrath of God was poured out on him for sin. Your sin. My sin. The Spirit of God is now beckoning, pleading, begging, Come on, will you come? Who else today? Who else today? Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Come on, stop messing with God. Get down here. If that's you, right now. Anybody else? I'm going to wrap this thing up. Don't miss this opportunity. You just come right now. Come. They're coming. Come on. You can come too. You can come too. everyone up front 
All right, a lot of tears up here. That's because the Spirit of God's working on your hearts right now. That's a good thing, all right? You can put a smile on your face, though. This is, this is the best decision of your life right here. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. Right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance. You're not wondering or concerned. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, like the Bible says. Brand new on the inside. Get a new start, new lease on life. Okay. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to help find out what to do next in your walk with God. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? Okay. Thirdly, he'll talk to you about a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Okay. And it's easy. It's free. You need to do it. And then he's going to let you come right back out into the church service. Now, listen, I'll, I'll talk a little long about the announcements and stuff like that to give you guys some time to pray, get that information, and to get back to your seats so that you don't miss the message. Okay. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Come on, Jesus saves. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.